Welcome to episode one of The Lowdown Show. I'm Neil Graham. My guest is Michael Ulerich, an international award-winning motorcycle designer, product planner, market analyst, and the founder of Motorcycle Global. During his 25-year career, he's worked for Yamaha, Piaggio, Aprilia, BRP, Damon, Potential Motors, as well as consulted for more than a dozen other manufacturers. His work and analysis have been featured in the Globe and Mail, Reuters, Wired, the New York Times Online, and in most international motorcycle trade publications. Despite his professed love of electrification, Michael drives a VW Vanagon and, curiously, a Chrysler Cordoba. He's based in Halifax, Canada. But before we dive into the show, a word from our sponsor. eBay Motors is here for the ride. With some elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love, you transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. Shall we take the plunge? And let's get straight into it. Electrification, motorcycle electrification, I find fascinating for so many reasons. And I know this is sort of your sweet spot. So uh, lately, there's been a whole bunch of high profile uh, implosions of electric companies. Can you take us through some of that? And then we'll just let the conversation unfold from there. Sure. I, I mean, it is a, a hot topic, uh, not least of which because there have been uh, a number of you know, uh, companies that have struggled, are struggling. And, you know, last month, that being the beginning of 2024, uh, Cake um, folded, which was a very high profile, if fairly small manufacturer from, from Europe. And, you know, we're at the tail end of, you know, sort of the, the big beginning of electrification. Like it's, it's, Electric cars have been normalized. It's it's completely embedded into mainstream in the developing world, in the Western world. That electric cars are real. They're they're a thing. Maybe not for everyone, but but nobody disputes that that they're a main a major part of the business. On two wheels, uh, there was an enormous amount of energy and expectation about four years ago, pre pandemic, uh, and during the pandemic, it actually accelerated. Uh, enormous amounts of money were invested into electric vehicle startups, like, you know, hundreds of billions. But on the two wheel side, um, you know, many billions were spent on electrifying two wheels. And, you know, most of the brands that people read about in magazines like Wired or online, you know, that were all over the Internet from 2020 to very recently um, have struggled or gone out of business. Now, now, why is that? Now, this is the thing that I find sort of curious is that, is this one of these cases where manufacturers were so far ahead or these startups were so far ahead of where the market was that, that there's this disconnect? Because it seems like we're at, the, we're at the advent of something and yet already everything is collapsing. Or, or is that just what happens when a new technology is, is introduced? Is that a normal thing? Uh, I would say yes. The answer, the short answer is yes, it is a normal thing. Um, were the manufacturers ahead of the consumer? No. Um, so this leads broadly into the sort of bifurcation of, of electrification on two wheels. Um, there were a lot of legacy brands, and by legacy, I mean brands that have been making motorcycles for many, many decades. Uh, the names that most people will be familiar with, the Japanese labels like Honda and Yamaha, etc., um, European brands, BMW, KTM, Ducati, and then, you know, Harley Davidson, they all dabbled in it, um, mostly at a very limited showcase level, uh, with some notable exceptions from like BMW and Harley. Um, their products were not ahead of the consumer. Their products were very much in line with what their consumers were already buying on the combustion side. The startups all tried to be, to use their phrase, disruptive. Um, and for the most part, they all went into technologies or markets or niches where there hadn't pre previously really been a market. Um, and, you know, 
kind of basic business rules are, you, you know, if you're going to try and sell something, make sure somebody's out there who wants to buy the thing you, you're, you're trying to sell. Um, and I, my thesis on this, and I think the evidence is strong to support it, is that uh, they were largely selling products that nobody wanted. Which takes us to cake. And of course, I have to say, you can't have your cake and eat it too, because we have to touch on every cliche. Um, can you take us through cake and what happened and a little bit about the company and then what happened? Because there was a lot of hype surrounding this brand. Yes, there was. And and I did a pretty uh, thorough uh, investigation of cake when the news came out in February that the, the company was filing for bankruptcy. There was an initial wave of, of shock and surprise from most of the media, uh, especially in the motorcycle side and mobility side. Like this company was everywhere from a media standpoint for six years. Um, so they're a Swedish company <clears throat> founded in the, the sort of just before the pandemic hit. And they were founded by this serial entrepreneur who describes himself as a storyteller, first and foremost. Uh, that's his training. He doesn't have, he's not an engineer. He's not a, a, a you know, a formally trained businessman. And he had crafted this, this company around this Scandinavian design uh, cliche. Uh, you know, everything was very, very clean and sort of, you know, these, these frosted grays and whites and a tremendously successful brand building exercise, really good visuals, really good communications. And, you know, they were sending out a press release monthly, basically, um, and something significant every quarter. And they were, uh, they were the darling of the sort of mobility, you know, literati. Um, what happened was they just didn't move product. Um, in total, they sold less than 6,000 vehicles. And now 6,000 is not nothing. But after, you know, six or eight years, that's not a lot. $75 million they raised and, you know, built six uh, shops, like standalone, like boutique stores to retail them from had all these big announcements about selling 300,000 vehicle letter of, uh, letter of intent with a company in Spain and, or pardon me, Mexico and in China and factory deals and this and that, you know, supporting, you know, initiatives, environmental initiatives and stuff like this. But at the end of the day, they, they weren't profitable. And some would say, well, that's normal in startups. Sure. But their burn rate, which is how much money they burn monthly, to you know to compensate for this was just extremely high um then they had unfortunately two pretty catastrophic recalls uh battery failure so total battery replacement on their flagship product and then on every one that it was ever built and then a structural frame suspension component failure on their largest volume seller and because they were direct as consumer which means that they you bought the bike wherever you were in the world directly from their website and they sent it to you individually it meant that they had to individually recall all of those vehicles wherever they were and offer you with a, a complete replacement or refund. And they couldn't do that. Now, when you say they burned through a lot of money, can you give us a sense of how much money is how much money? 75 million us, 60 million Euro over, you know, four years. It's a, not a lot of money in automotive. In motorcycle, that's a staggering amount of money. You're listening to The Lowdown Show, presented by advrider.com and supported by ebaymotors.com. Given, Michael, given these high profile failures, Cake, I mean, what would it have taken for Cake to be successful, in your view? So I think this is germane to the conversation writ large about um, electric motorcycles or, or motor, electric motorcycle startup failures. What Cake did successfully was unique. What they did that ultimately caused them to fail is common among most of these um, high profile or just generally most of the EV motorcycle startup failures. It's basic industry boilerplate business. Um, Cake failed because they didn't have adequate experience operating a business in this industry. The battery failure, that can happen to anyone. 
it happens unfortunately it, the, you know electrification is still fairly new it doesn't happen a lot but it, it, it can happen so fine but having uh to re recall a motor vehicle every manufacturer has to do that if you don't have a plan in place resources and personnel with experience to identify these kind of potential pitfalls and have a plan of what to do if that happens we know in the case of cake because i specifically reached out to the suppliers and i i interviewed the ceo the cto a number of other employees who chose to remain off record and i talked to the suppliers the suppliers told cake that in the case of the the frame and suspension failure that their design was weak and that they chose to use a aluminum steering tube instead of a steel one and you know, when your supplier who supplies Honda and Suzuki and other manufacturers who works in the industry says, hey, you know, um, this is a this is going to be problematic and you don't listen to them because you know better because you're disruptive um, and then it blows up in your face. I have very little sympathy for you. Um, they didn't employ a single person with any motorcycle engineering experience, not not one. Um, they had very limited engineering period. They were, you know, two thirds of the, of the staff were in marketing and branding and sales. And that's all you got to know. It's motor vehicles. So what can we learn from cake that, you know, we can extrapolate onto a lot of these other startups that are not doing so well. You can innovate, you can be disruptive. You can change the way you sell the vehicle or the propulsion system. But at the end of the day, it's still a motor vehicle. It's still a motorcycle. It still behaves on bumpy roads and in the rain and, you know, under extreme loads the way any other motorcycle will. And therefore, you're going to have the same problems come up one way or the other. Don't reinvent the wheel when you don't have to. And so uh, it seems like there's a degree of, of sort of human hubris in this, which is that they seem to get so caught up in being new and different that they forget they actually have to make a thing that, that a motorcycle company is actually not just an Instagram account. Yeah, I would agree. And, you know, if you look at, for example, the this table that I that I shared, um, which is a by no means complete list of but it's a list of companies that would be familiar to anyone who's following the motorcycle sort of innovators and in mobility innovation space, you know, half of these companies are dead, having delivered nothing or very little, um, burned through enormous amounts of capital. That list alone is a billion dollars of investment. Um, and the number of vehicles delivered is very small. Um, some of them are laughably. I mean, the, there are two companies here that are would be categorized by any business leader as a zombie company. They exist because they keep coming back for money, um, but haven't made any, any profit and, and that would be zero and, and, and live wire, nay, Harley Davidson, hundreds of millions of dollars spent to make pretty small numbers of vehicles. And, you know, the, the reason for these failures, generally speaking is not following some pretty fundamental lessons learned over 130 years that humanity has been making motorcycles successfully. Um, very few people brought in from the outside, from outside the disruptors view, but actually from industry, from Europe, from Japan, from Asian countries, where there is a deep talent pool, um, not listening to suppliers, not listening to the market. Um, you know, and some of these brands, like people will know Mission Motors was everywhere for years this was the future it's on jay Leno's garage it's on every magazine cover it's you know it's winning awards you know bramo was the same alta was the same people wax on about how wonderful these products were but they ultimately they weren't they weren't wonderful products they burned through enormous amounts of capital they ruined people's lives um, who worked at those companies um not the people who own them uh, the bikes i mean and um and in the end, they, the, the product failed. So um, it is hubris. It is the arrogance to think you can do better than a company that makes 10 million motorcycles a year or 20 million motorcycles a year or has been in business for 75 years globally, profitably. Um, that's pretty dumb. So Michael, this the startup culture, which is really easy to dismiss because we're so familiar with failed startups, um, explains a lot of the bikes you just talked about. 
but of course, Harley Davidson's Livewire, which I thought was a really beautiful bike, is a beautiful bike from a major company, Harley Davidson, although it's now it's been spun off to a separate company. Um, but it's a it's a real counterpoint to the the bikes you were just talking about. So take us through the Livewire experiment and and how that's gone. Sure. And for the record, I completely concur. It's a great looking motorcycle. It's beautifully made. It's beautifully finished. Uh, handling is excellent. It's a good product. Um, and when they announced it in 2013, it blew me away. Um, you know, it blew me away because they, they were very good at keeping it a complete secret. And then it was just there. And then it was everywhere. And okay, 2013, it was announced. And then they showed it on in various forms. And But they took it on a road show. And, you know, they let consumers try it or at least sit on it. And I tried it. Uh, at a motorcycle show in Canada where it was on a, on a, on a rolling floor and you could just spin it up and, you know, it was compact and futuristic and it was optimistic. So bravo to Harley for, for doing it. Now it took them a long time to, to commercialize, you know, it did not hit the market until late 2019. That's a long time from presenting something, especially at the cutting edge of technology. You know, and when it did come out, there's no way to sugarcoat this. It was a complete sales flop. Um, you know, it came out initially for 29,000 US, which is a lot of money for any motorcycle. It had a very small battery, um, even by 2019, 2020 standards, it was a modest battery, um, you know, just under 15 kilowatt hours. That's, you know, so it had limited range. Um, and the dealers were either unprepared or, you know, chose to willfully ignore it. A lot of hot air has been, you know, spent, expelled, comparing it to the um, um, V-Rod. The, the Buell. <laughs> Buell, yes, uh, and V-Rod. You know, Matt Levitich, the former CEO of Harley Davidson, in my view, and this is you know me editorializing, I think he er, he deserves a lot of credit that he didn't get. He got a lot of hate. Uh, ultimately, lost his job, was uh, you know not renewed, uh, replaced anyway, um, for this you know many roads to Harley Davidson strategy where he hypothesized, well, we're going to make an electric bike. We're going to make you know, cruisers that can actually stop and have, you know, mo you know, modern brakes and modern suspension. And then, you know, so we're going to continue to build our traditional vehicles, but we're going to make them more, more modern, bring in touch screens and TFT screens and, you know, an app, app, you know, connectivity, but then make an electric motorcycle. And then he forecast making like these small electric vehicles, sort of like what Livewire is trying to do now. And, you know, these big changes take time and they take time because you have this traditional ma ma manufacturer with, with, you know, um, strong values and the traditionalists didn't like it. Well, too bad. The traditionalists at Porsche didn't like that they were making a four door SUV for, you know, wealthy, you know, suburbanites, but ultimately that's why Porsche is still in business because they sell a lot of SUVs and, and four door sedans, the 911 will not keep that company alive. So this was the right strategy, in my view. When Harley finally did bring the live wire to market, it wasn't supported. I saw very little advertising. It's clear to any casual observer that by the time the bike was in dealers, the company had given up on it, or at least internally was pushing back, internally. There's no other explanation why we didn't see Super Bowl ads for the live wire. We didn't see television ads for the live wire. We didn't see big paper ads in the remaining print ma magazines and special editions. And, you know, there was n very little marketing and the dealers hated it. My local dealer had a level three DC fast charger branded with Harley Davidson installed outside. And then they like put a picnic table in front of it to literally like the, the people who worked there were so anti this that they were like making it impossible to use to the point where you know they they disconnected this the charger it's still there but it, it's not connected to anything 
And um, the bike failed. I mean, the bike failed. You know, they sold less than 2,000 vehicles since the launch in both Harley Davidson and Livewire brands. And um, that means they didn't recoup their cost. The technology was obsolete by the time, you know, it hit the market. And you get into this doom loop where, you know, people will say, you see, it didn't work. Um, and so there's no point in pursuing it, which is a shame because with an updated battery and, you know, faster charging, I think, and a better price, I think it would have worked. But they were, in my view, frankly speaking, greedy. And even now at thirty uh, nineteen thousand dollars, it's still far too expensive for the target audience. In a nutshell, good product, completely ignoring what people are willing to spend for that kind of product. Now you have, uh, I do believe you have a graph with some other shocking numbers about the yes. live wire. Yes, I do. What you see here in, you know, turquoise is what Harley Davidson themselves told investors at the launch of Livewire were going to be their sales for Livewire. I mean, fantasy is putting it kindly. Now, you know, it's not for me to, to you know, to uh, cast negativity at the, you know, when you embark on an enterprise, you want to be, you want to see the best case forward. But like that last figure, 2025, theoretically next year, they were going to sell 55,000 vehicles. That would have been roughly what Ducati sells a year. I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to say that, that that's, that's magical thinking. That there's no brand in the world that could go from zero to Ducati in five years. Um, and that's what they told investors. That's what they told their partners who, you know, invested $300 million in this enterprise. And then in orange, the little tiny slivers are what they actually sold. And in 2023, it was 660 vehicles. And, you know, the vast bulk of those, 550 or so, were the new S2 Del Mar. Um, the Livewire 1, which is the original vehicle, sold in less than 100 vehicles last year. Like those are numbers that would make Bimota blush. Oh my. And so when you think of the cost of R and D to, to build that, I mean, and you said, because it took years and years from when they announced yeah. the project to when it actually made it to the marketplace. I mean, what kind of money did they invest in this thing? Hard to say. Um, they're a public company. I mean, Harley Davidson is a public company. Well, actually both of them are, um, but they don't break out, um, they break out R and D in total, but not per project. At this point, it's been a decade. You know, it's twenty four. They first presented their their running prototypes in thirteen fourteen. So over ten years, it doesn't look so bad. The other way to look at it, which is across two thousand odd vehicles, slightly less. Um, you know, it's it's pretty bad. Like the, each one of those motorcycles could have cost a hundred thousand north of a hundred thousand dollars if you if you you know amortize the investment cost um which i suspect is why they stopped pushing it and why they stopped there's no derivative of that original platform it's just quietly gonna they're gonna sell off the vehicles they've got and in fact if you go as i have and looked at global inventory there are more than a few hundred demo or zero kilometer like brand new old stock 21s and 22 live wires in dealers globally so it's it's not a it's not a good situation and so they spun it off what, what, off is, their what is the sorry what is the status of live wire now i mean they just introduced a new bike recently which is kind of a peculiar looking cruiser well is i mean you, so have, you have to ask them um Last year they sold, you know, like I said, just under 600 of the new, of their S2. Um, how many of those were actually sold to customers and how many were sold to dealers? Because Harley Davidson uh, lists a sale when a dealer takes it off of their hands. So it ha it's, it's, it's gone from the factory, from the manufacturer to the dealer. That's considered a, a shipment, a sale, not when it's registered in customer hands. And that's just their accounting practice. So it's hard to say. 
but um, 500 vehicles globally for a new platform that shares nothing with any other vehicle is not a great start. Given what you've told us about the startups, and then we went to a major manufacturer, Harley Davidson, which became Livewire, um, hasn't really had much success. So has electrification failed, which is what a lot of people in North America think? So the answer is absolutely not. Um, electrification on two wheels is a tremendous success. Um, it is in fact the fastest growing segment of uh, mobility worldwide. If you refer to it as two wheels powered by a, an electric motor, um, it, they sell far more than any other and the growth is far greater than in any other field. Um, this will surprise people until they kind of zoom out from, from a very sort of North American bias. So take us through that, that disconnect because, you know, the, the, in fact, a lot of viewers of this podcast will, will think that electrification is a wash and that it's done. And, and, and yet you're saying something very much the opposite. So explain, explain this disconnect. Sure. So I think one of the most important things to understand is that the United States is less than 1% of the world motorcycle market for volume, less than 1%. So what we see if we're looking at a North American audience, Canada, the US, I shouldn't say North America because Mexico is a very, very large motorcycle market. Um, so Canada and the US, they, it's, it's seen as, as like, well, what I don't see means it doesn't exist. Globally, the world bought about 63 million motorcycles last year, um, of which about a million and just under 11 million, pardon me, just under uh, 1 million, 100,000, were electric motorcycles with um, more than five horsepower. And if you include mopeds, so think like a Vespa, but electric, that number is over 35 million. So it's an enormous volume of people buying new electric power two-wheelers, um, you know, classified as you know, a motorcycle in some description uh, around the world, largely in South Asia. So, you know, we're talking India, Pakistan, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, huge market, um, Cambodia, and, and, and China. And uh, actually, tremendous success stories on a business front. Um, if you want to look at the next slide. You know, there are examples here um, that show sort of the, the broadly the success pre-pandemic and just into the pandemic. Um, you know, you can see zero there. You can see live wire there. You can see, um, you know, a super 73, which is interesting because that's an American startup that skirts the line between motorcycle and bicycle. They have motorcycle power available, which is requ theory requires license and insurance, but a lot of times people are using it for off-road purposes only and, you know, kind of off the books. But then you have Gogoro and Neo and Ultraviolet and BMW, um, who, you know, and Piaggio with Vespa and Yamaha with the Neos, like a lot of electric mopeds, scooters being made by the tens of million across Europe, across Japan, across South Asia, from big brands and new start, uh, startups, but big startups like Gogoro, which is that blue uh, electric scooter uh, just underneath the word market explosion. That's a startup, highly valued, big rollout in Taiwan, and then moving on to other markets. Um, and then, like I said, the Chinese, Yadea is a brand most North Americans have never heard of. It's a huge company in China that makes over 6 million electric uh, mopeds a year. Uh, so tremendous success. Um, and if you go to the next slide, it's even easier to understand. That's the total number of combustion motorcycles sold over the last 10 years. And you can see it's, you know, it's gone up. There's a dip during the pandemic. But what you'll notice with electric motorcycles is no dip. It just keeps climbing. Um, you know, now the number is much smaller. Like I said, you know, it's, it's you know, a million and change versus 60 million. But any business person will tell you, you know, where do you want to operate? You want to operate in the fast growing segment that is quickly going to replace um, combustion, especially in urban areas where governments are starting to say, you can't drive a gasoline vehicle into Paris. 
you can't drive a gasoline combustion vehicle into downtown Beijing or Shanghai. So, you know, that's the growth segment and that's where the market is going. So it seems like, um, you know, the motorcycle as it is in North America is a luxury item. It seems like electrification doesn't work there, but when, at least based on what you've shown us, but when you think of the motorcycle as a, or a not so much motorcycle, but as an electric powered vehicle as something practical, especially in countries where the climate is more amenable to riding year round, then it's a totally different thing. So it is, what is the relationship between electrification and the motorcycle as we know it in North America? Is that a dead thing? No, it's, well, maybe. <laughs> I wish the answer was. <laughs> um, so motorcycle sales as defined by the MIC in, in the US have been roughly stable for a decade, around half a million units, plus and minus, you know, good years, bad years. Half a million is not nothing. Um, nearly half of that is off-road vehicles. So motocross and dirt bikes and race bikes. Uh, so, you know, on road, absolutely the U S customer, the Canadian customer, and a lot of Northern European customers see the motorcycle as a toy. It's a, it's a, it's a thing you use to amuse yourself. Maybe you justify it by doing some commuting on it, but it is a luxury. And I think what you said earlier is accurate to a point. 98% of motorcycles sold last year had less than 10 horsepower, gas or electric. That's the disconnect. If you go to Mexico, which is a huge motorcycle market, or Brazil, which is even bigger, like we're talking over a million units, you know, 10, just huge. You can argue, well, the weather is good, but the weather is good in a lot of the lower United States. The weather is not good in the UK um, or Northern Italy um, or, you know, many parts of Europe, France, for instance, like the top third of France does, has a pretty ugly winter. And yet historically people rode motorcycles and mopeds all year round as a practical form of, of transportation. So I don't buy the argument that it's weather related. Northern China is cold. Beijing is cold. It snows. And yet mopeds everywhere. Um, it's partly cultural, um, is a culture here of fear, um, you know, justified or not around, uh, riding amongst all these SUVs. And the other thing is, and this is my thesis is, is a product disconnect. When, a, when your starting price is 10,000 us dollars in 2024, that that's entry level, that that's considered a commuter motorcycle. You just aren't listening to the public. Um, and if you actually bring up the next slide, um, we can see the evidence of that. There are basically three clusters of electric motorcycles um, in the U.S. context. There are e-bicycles, uh, so e-bikes. Uh, these are low speed, low power, classified as bicycles. You don't need insurance. In most places, you don't need a helmet. These labels, these brands, maybe you know what they are, maybe you don't. On the bottom left, those are bicycles. Those are the, the volume leaders. There are thousands of brands, but those are the volume leaders, brands that are common on, you know, the kind of thing you get at Costco. Then in the top right, you know, you've got Livewire, Harley, Energica, Italian electric superbikes, BMW with their electric mopeds. And very expensive, beautifully finished. And then the electric Vespa, for instance, very expensive, all motorcycles, legally speaking, hard to get to. You have to get a license. You have to have a garage. You have to pay insurance. They're very hard to, you know, expensive to buy and insurance is expensive. But then there's this cluster in the middle. And in the U.S., we have seen big success broadly over the last five, seven years in this vague bicycle, motorcycle, moped area, premium being a perception, as you say, an Instagram perception rather than factual. And you see the huge success of products like Suron and their imitators like Talaria and Vmoto with the Soko brand and startups like Super 73 and Onyx, which briefly, again, got everyone excited and particularly California. These were under $5,000 purchases. This is what the market wants. 
And they don't care that it's powered by electrons. They don't care that it, if it was two stroke, they're not buying it because it's electric. They're buying it because it's cool and it's cheap. And you can go to the store, you can go to school, you can go to work. It's lightweight. You can put it in an elevator and you're and bring it into your apartment or, you know, your condo. Um, this is not rocket science. This was the success of the Japanese in the 1960s with Super Cub and things of this nature. Make things that are affordable and practical, but have a fun element, a fun component. Zero is just on the edge of that bubble because they do have one offering, which is fairly affordable, the FX. Um, and um, this is the area where electric vehicles could really succeed and actually motorcycles gasoline powered included like the grom do succeed because it's high fun low barrier to entry well it is interesting because i was just you sort of answered my question which is that that if it works for electric vehicles and if motorcycle conventional motorcycle sales are falling then isn't this the area that everyone should gravitate to they should and actually, if you look at the next slide, I mean, it's 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 illustrated by, you know, people can visualize what the what we're talking about. This is where people are having fun. Low stress is not worrying about a car payment or a, you know, fifteen thousand dollar Ducati payment. Um, these are fun, lighthearted vehicles, and they work with electrons just as much as they work with 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 combustion. Now, combustion is a, is a sunset technology. There is no rational person looking at purely the business case could argue otherwise. Um, if you're not allowed to sell combustion vehicles in the key profit making motorcycle markets past 2030, why would you invest in that now? But if you are going to do it using existing motors and platforms, then do it cheap make a crf 250 or 300 or this classification of motorcycle and and promote the hell out of that because those are fun bikes and you can get a lot more people on a motorcycling that way but as long as manufacturers are chasing margin where you can make two thousand dollars per bike by selling or more by selling a twenty five thousand dollar adventure touring model for old men it's not going to change. But it isn't, doesn't this also, whether intentionally or not, doesn't this just play to the strength of the electric vehicle? Because, I mean, there has to be, I would think, a huge jump in technology for a, a vehicle, say a sport touring vehicle or an adventure touring vehicle that you would ride in Canada or the US to actually get to the point where it's usable, where you can have a range of three or 400 miles where it can recharge in a reasonable amount of time, where chargers are available. And because of the nature of a motorcycle, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's just not a lot of space for a battery and batteries are heavy. So is that even something that suits that kind of motorcycle? And will it ever suit that kind of bike the way we just hop on and ride hundreds of miles? Will that ever happen? I mean, the answer is, of course it will. Um, you know, I, I remember these conversations in 2010 you know, in 2009, you know, Nissan, forgetting Tesla for the moment, because before 2013, they were a bunch of guys in California with a sports car that was never going to change the world. Um, but Nissan comes out in, or in 2010 and says, or 2011 and says, we have a, the Nissan Leaf, an electric car for regular people, five seats, five has a hatchback, whatever, hundred miles of range because they argued most people drive with a city urban lifestyle, drive less than that per day and you'll charge it at home. Those facts have not changed. And in fact, that is the reality. Um, you know, now we've had tremendous innovation on the battery front on the charging side in particular, and Tesla is unequivocally the champion here. Uh, they deserve the credit they deserve that they have, you know, for the success of their, you know, financial success and their volume success. You know, selling a million electric cars a year is not a, is not a joke. And you can go all day as long, you know, your bladder will run out before your battery does, and that's fine. Motorcycles, you're right. It's not going to like unless there's a massive step change in the battery energy density. It's not going to change. That said. 
There are no motorcycles that can go 300 miles. None. Zero. With gasoline. None. Like, you know, the, the, the average motorcycle today has 18 liter fuel tank. Um, that means that if it's a big capacity machine over a thousand cc's, you get 200, maybe 250 kilometers of range out of that. That's what, 180 miles? And the argument is yes, but I can get gas anywhere. I can fill up in five minutes. That's true. The use case hasn't changed. Humans haven't changed. The luxury consumer who buys the $25,000 GS, they dream about riding in Argentina, but what they're really doing is, you know, five weekends a year, they'll put on, they'll, they'll go for a long ride. They'll ride for two hours, they'll stop, they'll ride for two hours, and then they're done because they're 55 years old and then something we might be familiar with. And, and, and they have aches and pains and physical limitations like their bladder. Um, so it will happen. That's not where electrification on two wheels needs to focus. It needs to do the Nissan Leaf thing. And that's where the bulk of electric cars are, not here, but globally. It's the daily driver. And in China, there are 100 million electric scooters and people live in apartments. They don't have houses, but you remove the little battery twice a week. You charge it in your flat and you bring it down in the morning. We're not afraid to charge this twice a day sometimes because we accept that in, in response to, to having all this you know, usability. It's a supercomputer. It's a touchscreen. It's an entertainment device. A non-smartphone you can charge once a week, but I don't think it's a big leap. Look, the evidence is in. The vast majority of the motorcycle buying public in South Asia, which represent you know 90% of the motorcycle buying public globally, accept this as a better solution for their daily two-wheeled use. Um, as far as touring is concerned, it'll happen. It's just going to take another five or seven years. And now a word from our sponsor, after which I'll throw a log in the fire and share a heartwarming tale. eBay Motors is here for the ride. Let's talk clutches, motorcycle clutches, the unheralded coupling between engine and transmission. I've been vexed by clutches, a condition I traced to a machine I loved, but a machine that showed me no love in return, a 1974 Norton Commando. Then is now perhaps the most mellifluous sounding machine in the history of motorcycling. The Commando was one design shortcoming piled upon the next. However, no single item of the Commando was more reflective of its Axe Age engineering than the clutch. And here's why. After the transmission main shaft exited the gearbox on its way to the Commando's port side, port side, it had to pass first the sprocket, then run way out into the housing for the primary drive. And on the very end of the main shaft sat the clutch, which meant that approximately six feet of the main shaft was unsupported by a bearing, which meant naturally that the main shaft bent. But it was difficult to know that it was bent because the tweak of only a few thousandths of an inch was difficult to diagnose. But it was enough to make the clutch exhibit conflicting characteristics. It would slip and then grab, slip and grab. The only cure was a new main shaft. Towards the end of our relationship, I could change the commando's main shaft in around an hour. 53 minutes was my best recorded time. With over 122 million parts, you can make sure your number one ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof racks, bumpers, Whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. What is working in electrification and what isn't working? I would summarize it this way. Electric motorcycles are working at the low end of the market. Low end in terms of power and low end in terms of cost. Now, not cheap, not trash, but accessible mass market. Commuters, vehicles for off-road fun, you know, things that are 
that don't require high high barrier to entry and where they're not working are as luxury motorcycles as direct replacement for your you know for your 1000 cc touring or sport or roadster motorcycle in the combustion world so that's kind of interesting because it's like i said earlier it seems this peculiar thing to me that that it's almost like electrification of two wheelers has stumbled into maybe what is the key to maybe bring motorcycling back as something that's viable because all the there's so much hand wringing amongst OEMs about you know young people not wanting motorcycles and 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 you know we have this market where there's these ultra high end products. I was looking at a Ducati V4R for fifty some fifty five thousand dollars in a dealership the other day, and I mean they can't sell a ton of those. And then, you know, you're telling me the electrification. So, you know, I mean, it's kind of curious how this is happening, isn't it? That maybe electrification is sort of inadvertently, the market is, we're, we're being told what people want. I think, and this is something that I haven't talked to you about in the past, um, or to most people. I mean, we're enthusiasts, you know, I, I'm we're professionals in this industry in different ways. And as a consequence of those two facts, we we're, we're steeped. We read about it. We, we ride a lot. We know what's going on and that's great. And my generation, certainly the mantra in my career starting in the you know, early two thousands was we got to, you know, we got to listen to and focus on the enthusiasts, the hardcore, you know, KTM built an empire. They came back from bankruptcy to Europe's largest OEM selling, you know, 350, almost 400,000 vehicles a year um, by, by doing that, by focusing on their, like th building their values around this idea of like, we're ready to raise hardcore. That's our market. You know, Harley Davidson hardcore. We're the American open road cruiser. My opinion is that we've let the lunatics run the asylum. Lunatics, including people like me and you. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, what makes Honda the world's most successful motorcycle company, not just this year, but ever, uh, is that they make products for normal people that allow them to be profitable, that allow them to be trustworthy. And then they can go off and have the most successful racing program in the history of motorcycling to make the, some of the most exciting enthusiast products you know, available. Um, and the same can be said for Yamaha and the same can be said for, you know, increasingly brands that people didn't know about five years ago, like CF Moto. Um, you have to be a business first before you can be an enthusiast, you know, whatever. And, you know, to the to, you know, coming full circle to the conversation about Harley or with the live wire, you know, it's executed brilliantly on so many levels. And at the same time, like, did you actually talk to normal people? Um, you know, normal people, not Harley people. Did you talk to someone who's motorcycle curious and was like, I kind of want a bike, you know, circa 2015, 2017, you know, a millennial in 2015, you know, who at that time was 30, starting to think about, you know, or in their late twenties, starting to think about maybe starting a family or getting married or starting a business or moving in the next step in their career, they got multiple priorities and sinking 30 K us into a starter bike is not one of them. So I think, you know, my feeling is that what electrification is, is the canary in the coal mine. Although that's a negative uh, met uh, metaphor. It's more like a, it's showing the way the success of Suron this Chinese off-road only lightweight $5,000 electric motorcycle is, is, is crystalline. It's saying people want bikes as long as they're not outrageous, you know? And when the Honda CB350 came out, that's what it cost in modern dollars, under $5,000. And, you know, the, the same boomers who are now like insisting that anything under a thousand cc's is for beginners, are like forgetting where they got their feet wet, which was, you know, Japanese small displacement bikes with 10, 20 horsepower that were fun. 
and didn't like impact their lives in a big way. Um, the luxury market is a hard space to operate despite it being a bull market. Um, I mean, we have a graphic. Now you've got that. some numbers on the um, uh, 10 years. You've got some numbers on the luxury market here, I believe, don't you? Yeah. It's a 10 year look and it's been a bull market. It's up 40% broadly, 40% growth. And you can see KTM taking the lion's share of that growth, BMW, huge growth. If, if we extranded that line past 2014 into the past, BMW was, was on the verge of closing its motorcycle unit um, in the early 2000s. So they went from 50,000 to over 200,000. Um, it's a long and steady growth. Triumph has gone up about 30%. Ducati has gone up about 20%. You know, Harley Davidson in Indian, I mean, Harley Davidson has gone down 40%. So how they how you, lost how, that much. How do you, how do you explain that? Sorry, how do you explain that? Uh, not listening to reality, not listening to the market. They were listening to their people internally. They were listening to enthusiasts of Harley Davidson and they've been making good money. Um, doing it. So as a business, uh, they doubled down on margin and they've been delivering profitability on a shareholder level. Um, but their, you know, their sales have been in a terminal slide, except for one blip in the 21, um, positive year in 21. And um, they seem content with that. And maybe that's natural. That's the evolution of that brand. And maybe that's why they spun off Livewire in the hope to pick up those sales on other in other areas but you know the, this graph illustrates that selling high-end motorcycles is hard ktm and bmw in particular triumph and ducati to a lesser extent have invested a lot of money to to fuel that growth and that wasn't marketing it was developing new products that people wanted um i will uh I think I would close this part of the conversation by quoting Lee Iacocca, of all people, um, you know, former uh, CEO and chair of, of Chrysler Corporation. Um, and before that, uh, the sort of prod prodigy at Ford in the 1960s, you know, he was many things, but one thing he, he understood with great clarity was, you know, the secret to success in motor vehicle um, manufacturing and sales. This is not really that complicated. Make products people want at a price they're willing to pay. That's it. Now that's hard, you know, hard to do, but that's the, that should be the guiding star for any company selling motor vehicles, especially motorcycle, make a good product at a price people are willing to pay. If you start believing your own marketing and this, you know, again, full circle to cake, if you think there's a giant market for twelve thousand dollar ten horsepower electric motorcycles, then you live in a world that I'm not familiar with, <laughs> and and the the facts don't support that. You're listening to the Lowdown Show, presented by ADVRider.com and supported by eBayMotors.com. I think the most interesting thing that I took from this conversation is that. We've gotten so far away from what motorcycling really could be or should be that it's the market is split into this you know ridiculously high end thing that most of us can't afford, including myself. And then, you know, so much of what got us interested in motorcycling in the first place, and especially in the 1960s, when you think of the you know Honda's great tagline, the best tagline ever, which is, hmm. "You meet the nicest people on a Honda." Yeah. And those bikes in today's marketplace are essentially served by, to a large degree, by these sort of uh, inexpensive electric vehicles you're talking about. So we've kind of circled around and, and, you know, maybe we have seen the future, maybe electric propulsion is one of those things that really will reinvigorate the sport. I would say that we have to stop selling motorcycles based on their propulsion or their technology and stop selling motorcycles to motorcyclists and start making and selling motorcycles for people. In closing, a word from our sponsor. eBay Motors is here for the ride. With some elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love, you transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own. 
brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Thank you for listening to The Lowdown Show.